Hello, and welcome back to Sotten Brain Hub. My name is Calvin, and today we'll be taking a look at both pain and analgesia in labour. We'll start by reviewing the physiology behind the pain that is experienced in labour. Labour can be defined as the active process of delivering a fetus and is characterised by regular, painful contractions of the gravid uterus, which increase in frequency and intensity over time. These contractions help the cervix to dilate, allowing the fetus to move through the birth canal and ultimately be born. Labour is an incredibly painful personal experience. The pain experienced during labour is made up of two key components. Visceral pain, which occurs during the early first and second stage of labour, and somatic pain, which occurs during the late first and second stage of labour. Both visceral and somatic nerve impulses in labour pass to dorsal horn cells where they are processed and transmitted to the brain via the spinothalamic tract. This transmission to the hypothalamic and limbic systems is what accounts for both the emotional and autonomic responses associated with pain in labour. So let's take a deeper look at the visceral pain in labour first. The visceral labour pain originates from the uterus as a result of uterine contractions that are vital in aiding the delivery of the fetus. With each uterine contraction, pressure is transmitted to the cervix, which causes it to stretch and distend. The stretching and distension of the cervix activates local excitatory nociceptant afferent nerves, which are often small unmyelinated C fibres. These afferents transit through the cervix through part of the inferior hypogastric plexus. They then join sympathetic nerves in the sympathetic chain and synapse in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord via the T10 to L1 nerve roots. Pain is therefore referred to the T10 to L1 dermatomes such that it is normally felt in the lower abdomen, sacrum and back. This pain is often dull and poorly localised in nature and may present with a pressure or aching sensation. Some visceral pain can also travel with parasympathetic afferent nerves and account for referred pain to the S2 to S4 nerve roots that is not purely somatic. This is covered in more detail in one of our other videos where we explore the visceral afferent nerves from the pelvis and the pelvic pain line in more detail, so make sure to check that out if you'd like to learn more. The somatic or perineal labour pain occurs in addition to the visceral pain just described. This arises due to afferents that innervate the vaginal surface of the cervix, perineum and vagina. This pain occurs as a result of stretching, distension or ischemia of the perineum and vagina. It commonly manifests during the descent of the fetus, where during this stage of labour, the uterus contracts more intensely in a rhythmic and regular manner. Somatic pain is transmitted by fine, myelinated, rapidly transmitting A-delta fibres. This transmission occurs via the pudendal nerves and perineal branches of the posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh to S2 to S4 nerve roots. Somatic pain occurs closer to delivery and is sharp in character, whilst easily localised to the vagina, rectum and perineum. So now we know about the mechanisms by which pain arises in labour, we can take a look at some of the available analgesic options that can be utilised to reduce labour pain. To best understand how analgesia works in labour, it would be useful to recap our knowledge of the anatomy of the spine. The spine consists of bony vertebrae stacked on top of each other, with each vertebra being separated by a shock-absorbing intervertebral disc. Ligaments and muscles connect the vertebrae together to help maintain the structure of the spine. This helps to form the tunnel-like spinal canal that houses and importantly protects the spinal cord and its branching spinal nerves from damage. The spinal cord is bathed in cerebrospinal fluid and surrounded by a protective membrane called the dura. Just outside of this membrane is the epidural space. This space is filled with fluid and surrounds the spinal cord. It is bounded anteriorly by the posterior longitudinal ligament and posteriorly by the ligamentum flavum and is the first area that we can target in order to reduce pain in labour. An epidural is a way to deliver an anaesthetic to stop pain signals travelling from the spine to the brain. It involves injecting a small amount of anaesthetic into the epidural space of the spine. Nerves responsible for carrying pain signals from the body to the brain, called spinal nerves, 
are numbed by the anaesthetic injected in the epidural space. For example, the spinal nerves associated with T10 to L1 nerve roots. This blocks any subsequent pain signalling. The epidural space is reached by inserting a needle between two vertebrae, most commonly in the lumbar spine. The patient is asked to either lie down on their side, with knees tucked up into their chest, or alternatively, to lean forward while sat up. This serves to open up a space between the individual vertebra, allowing easier passage for the needle. A small catheter is threaded through the inserted needle, so that anaesthetic can be injected down into the epidural space. Whilst commonly administered in the lumbar region, epidural anaesthetics can be administered into any region of the spine. During labour, successful injection of the anaesthetic medication through the small catheter into the epidural space allows the patient to no longer feel pain in the lower part of their body. Spinal anaesthesia, more commonly known as a spinal block, is a little different in practice to an epidural anaesthetic, however the key principle remains the same. Unlike the epidural procedure, the needle is placed past the dura mater into the subarachnoid space. In order to reach this space, the needle must pierce through several layers of tissue and ligaments, which include the supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, and ligamentum flavum. It is important to apply our clinical knowledge here, and remember that because the spinal cord, specifically the conus medullaris, mm. typically ends at the L1 or L2 level of the spine, the needle in a spinal block has to be inserted below this, between either the L3 and L4 space, or the L4 and L5 space, in order to avoid injury to the spinal cord. When carrying out the procedure, patient positioning is essential to its success, and can affect how the anaesthetic spreads following administration. This often requires patients to take up either the sitting or lateral decubitus position. The needle is then guided into the spinal canal, into the subarachnoid space, and the anaesthetic injected, a process usually done without the use of a catheter. Spinal anaesthesia is capable of numbing the body below and sometimes above the site of the injection, and it is not uncommon for the patient to not be able to move their legs until the anaesthetic has worn off. So, putting this together, we can form a neat little summary. Spinal anaesthesia delivers the pain-relieving drug to the subarachnoid space, and therefore into the cerebrospinal fluid, allowing it to act on the spinal cord directly to have a more widespread effect below that level. An epidural delivers pain-relieving drugs in the space outside the dura and cerebrospinal fluid, and therefore has its main effect on the nerve roots leaving the cord at that particular level, rather than on the spinal cord itself. This has a more targeted effect. Spinal anaesthesia will last for a significantly lesser amount of time when compared to an epidural procedure. Additionally, an epidural also does not cause as significant a neuromuscular block as a spinal. But perhaps most important clinically, and as outlined earlier, an epidural may be given at a cervical, thoracic or lumbar site, whilst the spinal must be injected below the level of L2 to avoid piercing the spinal cord. Both epidural and spinal anaesthesia are usually combined with other medications, such as sedatives, to make the patient relaxed or sleepy, or further analgesics to relieve pain. These other medications are often given through a vein intravenously. Having covered epidural and spinal blocks, there is one further route to help relieve pain in labour that we haven't yet spoken about, and that is the pudendal nerve block. The pudendal nerve block is historically a common regional anaesthesia technique to provide perineal anaesthesia during obstetric procedures, including vaginal birth and repairs, and anorectal surgeries such as hemorrhoidectomies. The pudendal nerve is a sensory and motor nerve arising from the sacral plexus and forms from spinal nerve roots S2 to S4, the same nerve roots involved in the perineal somatic pain and visceral parasympathetic pain experienced in labour. The pudendal nerve passes through the greater sciatic foramen, where it then transverses through the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments before re-entering the perineum through the lesser sciatic foramen. After entering the pelvis, it accompanies the internal pudendal artery and vein, coursing anterior superiorly through the pudendal canal, a structure formed by the fascia of the obturator internus muscle. 
Inside the pudendal canal, the nerve divides into branches, first giving off the inferior rectal nerve, then the perineal nerve, and before continuing is the dorsal nerve of the penis or clitoris. To relieve labour pain, an injection called a pudendal block can be given through the vaginal wall and into the pudendal nerve in the pelvis, numbing the area between the vagina and the anus. Pudendal blocks do not relieve the pain of contractions, however. Major advantages of the pudendal block are that it works quickly, is easily administered, and does not affect the fetus. So hopefully now, you have a more in-depth understanding of the physiology of pain and labour, and some of the options we can utilise to reduce the pain that is experienced. Be sure to check out our other videos to learn more about many topics like this, and others related to neurology in the brain. I hope you enjoyed this video, and thank you for watching. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel to help explain the mysteries of the brain.